Hi, and welcome to another edition of Easy Theory. So what we're going to eventually prove today is something called the pumping lemma for context-free languages. So, I mean, pumping lemma for regular languages was already uh, chilling enough. Now we have pumping lemma for context-free languages, but I'll get you through it. So what we discussed last time was that if we have a grammar, a CFG, a G, and we insist that it is in uh, Chomsky normal form, then its parse tree uh, for any string at all of, of length at least a certain size is going to uh, have something uh, like this. So it's going to have a root, and it's going to have two children, and each one of those is going to have two children. Uh, although this is not necessarily the case, but it, it's very likely the case where uh, then we just continue like this, and you can eventually see that the tree will grow like a little pyramid here. And uh, in, in this tree, all the internal nodes uh, have uh, two children. And that's a consequence of the fact that if the grammar's in CNF, uh, the variable will have uh, will produce two variables, and so that's what it means to be an internal node, that the variable will produce uh, two variables, and so that's what it means that it has two children here. And if we didn't have the grammar in CNF, the right-hand side could be technically anything, so uh, the children underneath the node could theoretically be anything, but restricting it in this form allows us to restrict what the the what the um, parse tree actually looks like. But other than that, at the bottom of the tree, we'll have something like each of these uh, bottom nodes will produce one terminal. Because when we read the tree from left to right at the leaves, uh, we will read all of the terminals of the string that was created. And the, uh, the reason we chose CNF here was that the other type of rule, other than this one, was that a variable can produce exactly one terminal. So at the very bottom of the tree, it kind of looks like a Christmas ornament in some sense, that we have a bunch of variables having exactly one uh, child. So all of, of these nodes right here, so these nodes, although they're technically internal, I'm not going to consider them internal nodes. Uh, these nodes have one child. And all of the actually leaves, the things that are at the very, very, very bottom of the tree, uh, these uh, have exactly zero children. They're childless. Because they're terminals, and because it's a context-free grammar, we can't replace a terminal with anything. It's only a single variable with, uh, with something. And in this case, it's either two variables or one terminal. Okay? So... What we're going to do here is that the desired behavior, so we desire to uh, have the tree so big that we repeat variables going from the top to the bottom. So we want to repeat uh, at least, oops, not least, <laughs> I'm not renting anything uh, here, <laughs> repeat at least uh, one variable uh, from the top to the bottom of the tree. And uh, that gives some kind of repeating behavior, kind of like when we repeated the state in the DFA. So the, in order for this to actually work, if the tree is kind of short, in, meaning that the string that we're trying to uh, create is short, meaning that the tree is short, then it could theoretically be that there's no repetition of a variable going from the top to the bottom. So all that we really need is that we need to consider one specific path going from the top to the bottom. So uh, to do this, we need to ensure that the longest, so uh, as long as the longest one is uh, has some kind of repeat in here, then we're okay. It doesn't actually matter. But uh, we need to have at least one of the ways from the top to the bottom have some kind of repetition. 
So ensure the longest root to leaf uh, path. So, so th that's how we actually uh, write top to bottom formally. It's from the root, which is at the very top of the tree, uh, in some choice of going from the top to the bottom. Uh, and the bottom here is the leaf because it's at the bottom of the tree. So root to leaf path, uh, ensure that the longest one uh, repeats uh, uh, some uh, variable. Okay, as long as we have that one working, then it's okay. Um, so how are we going to do that? Well, if we actually try to look at this tree, so here's our tree again, and it may not actually look like this. This is just uh, what is called an artist's conception. So it, it may like be really short on one side and really long on the other one because we don't know anything about the tree, but Let's, su let's suppose that uh, what we want is that the, the longest root to leaf path, which is what this is right here. So I'm ensuring that the longest root to leaf path is whatever I'm determining this height to be. So if I make it so that this is the number of variables uh, plus one, then uh, whatever the longest root to leaf path is, let's just say it's this green one right here. It's just a, uh, oh, it doesn't, doesn't come up. <laughs> it only goes downwards. So let's say it's this one, and I'm going to actually notate that. So this, this path is this one right here. In, in fact, there, be, there could be multiple. So it, it may be that there are multiple longest paths, but I'm just picking one of them. So then this repeats some variable because if, if it didn't, then let's suppose that there are no repetitions of variables from the top to the bottom. Then because we have this being the number of variables plus one, then that can't possibly be by the pigeonhole uh, principle. So uh, if we didn't have a repetition, then that means that uh, we have some variable a, let's say right here, and there's no occurrence of variable a anywhere, but we have number of variables plus one pigeons, and we have uh, just the number of variables number of pigeonholes. So we have more variables that we see going from the top to the bottom than there are variables, which means that there must be a repetition somewhere. So let's let then, a be the variable that repeats. You can actually um, you can actually uh, ensure you can actually do slightly better than this because the variable s can't repeat here because s never appears on the right hand side of a rule because it's in CNF. But uh, th this is sufficient. In order, and let's say that A is the variable that repeats. So A appears here, and then somewhere else uh, A appears again. Well, what does that tell us about the string W that we have to generate down here? So this is the string W. Well, we know that the tree is binary. So the length of W is going to, uh, as long as W is at least uh, two to the power, the number, of variables plus one, which is the height of the tree, then that's sufficient. And this only will happen uh, if, um, if the tree is what is called a complete full binary tree, which means that uh, it doesn't stop early at some point here. It g goes completely down and it's exactly the same level all the way around. So as long as it's at least this amount, then that means that there is there must be some way to get from the top to the bottom with a repetition somewhere. Uh, actually, I think I need a plus one here to ensure this, but uh, it doesn't really matter because we won't actually use this. As long as this number exists given the grammar, then we're okay, which is all that we need. Okay, so let's try to analyze this a little bit. So I'm going to, oops, I am going to slightly modify this so that I have some room in the tree itself. So we know that the only variable in a 
a grammar that's in CNF can, that the only one that can make epsilon is the start variable. No other variable can actually make it. So we know that these, this variable A, because it repeats, can't be the start variable. So let me notate that. So this is not the start variable, which means that, oops, which means that A itself must generate something of the string. So let's look at what it can actually generate. So it generates something of the string. And the bottom A, of course, is also not the start variable, so it also makes something of the string too. By making something, I mean it makes at least one character. That's what I mean by that. Okay, so uh, what do we actually do with this? What am I going to do? I'm going to move this down a little bit. And I'm going to name each of these uh, pieces. So this part right here, I'm going to call the U piece. This, this, one, uh, this one right here is one that the top A produces, but the bottom A doesn't. And I'm going to call that V. The middle piece, which is the part that only A will generate, I'm going to call X. The, uh, the other side is going to be Y, and the other part, is, the very last part is going to be Z. Okay, so the string that we generated is uh, W, but I'm decomposing it into five pieces, U, V, X, Y, and Z. So how can we actually use this to our advantage? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt, <laughs> quote unquote attempt, to, uh, to copy this tree down so we can analyze it a little better. Paste. So let's actually look at this, this tree a little bit. So let's, let's try to understand what the variable A could actually make, a, only A itself. So A clearly can make the X part because it's just this variable A only making the X part through many, possibly many rules that are being applied here, but eventually it makes uh, X. So A can eventually produce uh, x. And I'm going to do slight uh, simplification to say uh, here, uh, when I say double arrow going right like this, with a little star on top of it, that's the same thing as saying applying a bunch of rules to get the thing on the right. So applying a bunch of rules to get x, I'm just shorthanding it this way. Okay, so then but if we look at one level up right here, we see that uh, A also makes VXY. So A will eventually make VXY, of course. Um, what else can we say? But more importantly, we can uh, use uh, the recursive structure of context-free grammars to say uh, this A right here at the top can make the V part and then whatever the A part actually makes. So we can actually combine these to say that A will generate uh, V, A, Y, and also A generates only X. Okay, so uh, this actually tells us uh, something important about A, that we can actually repeat um, uh, some structure of these V and Ys. Namely, it will also generate, if we apply this one right here over and over and over as many times as we want, uh, we will get a V on the left side and a Y on the right side. So what we'll eventually get is V, V, A, Y, Y, and then eventually make three Vs a three y's and you can see where we're going with this we can actually get v to the i a y to the i for any i at least zero okay so it's kind of similar to the the regular pumping lemma but here we have uh two pieces where the exponent on both of them is identical okay okay so then if that's the case, what we can do then is we can have the start variable, not A, the start variable can make, well, it can make the U piece, 
and then anything that the A could generate because this, this A right here is representing this A right here. So, and, and then with the Z part at the end. So it's the U piece plus whatever A can make and then a Z. But we already know what A can make, which is this. So this is, this, uh, we can also generate U, V to the I, A, Y to the I, Z, just by substituting A here with this piece right here. And also we know that A can generate X. So at the end of the day, we can say that S could generate U, V to the I, X, Y to the I, Z for any I at least zero. Cool. So uh, pictorially, what does this actually mean? That means, uh, yeah, so what does this actually mean uh, in terms of the parse tree? What it means is that if I copy and paste this big A parse tree down to where this second one is, then we will get an additional copy of V and Y, and this X went away when we pasted it back in, um, but we'll get it back because we're copying and pasting this whole thing, which includes the X. So we'll never get an additional copy of X, but we'll get uh, one copy of V and Y uh, each. Okay, so that's kind of nice, but let's uh, try to analyze this a little further. So uh, we saw in the regular pumping lemma that the, the part that had the exponent had to be non-empty uh, because it involved at least one transition. Uh, what do we actually do here? What do we know about V and Y? So let's try to analyze this. Uh, so I'm going to draw this a little bigger. So here's the top A here, and we have this path going to the bottom. Here's the second occurrence of A, and it makes something of the tree like this. So what can actually happen? Well, the, the worst possible thing that can happen, quote unquote, to make V and Y as short as possible is that this second A is as close as possible to the first one. So let's try to analyze uh, what that actually looks like. So the worst thing that can happen, uh, worst possibility I'm gonna call it, which is that we have the variable A right here, the top one, and we have the second occurrence of A uh, right underneath it. And then the right side uh, could have some other variable, but I don't really care what that is. Okay, so that's the worst thing that can happen. Uh, so let's actually visualize what the tree looks like underneath this. So if I just draw the rest of the tree out, note that the subparse trees under A and B uh, do not coincide. So uh, they're completely disjoint uh, from each other. And also note that uh, since uh, B is not the start variable, it, create, it creates a non-empty string. So, so this part right here, uh, yeah, let's, I'm making sure it's on screen. So this part is non-empty. The text went off. Yeah, that, that part is not empty. And, well, this part right here obviously is not empty also, but here's the key. This part right here, uh, if we visualize this uh, parse tree over in this context, this non-empty piece is this one right here. Okay, so this part is, let's actually draw it out. So this part's V, this part's X, this part's Y. This part is Y itself. And this part on the left is, uh, well, the V part is actually squished because the V part is what is generated on the left side by the top A, but not the bottom A. So it's on the left, generated by the top A, but not the bottom A. But because they coincide, it is the case that V on this side must be empty, believe it or not. 
So in this case, v is empty. Uh, so what really is over here is just x and nothing else. So in this case, the v part actually is empty. And if we flip the roles of b and a here, it will the, the roles of y and v reverse. It'll actually be that y is empty and v is non-empty. But the key is that because this is only on one side of the two, it can't be the case that v and y simultaneously are empty. So what we'll get out of this is that v and y can not be simultaneously, and yes, I've learned how to spell simultaneously, right? Uh, empty. So one way that we actually write this, and there are other ways you can do it too, um, the length of v, y together, so this is not in the original string because the x part separates them, but it's just considering those two pieces together as a different string. So v and y together, its length is at least one. One of the two at least is non-empty. It could be that both are non-empty because this picture right here uh, looks like the v and the y part are non-empty. But when it's as close as possible to the, the other occurrence of A, then one, uh, one side is going to be empty and the other one has to be non-empty because the grammar is in CNF. Isn't CNF awesome? Anyway, so that tells us the other condition and as you might expect, the uh, pumping one that we did before, the five pieces one, and this one are all that are actually needed. But in order to make the proof significantly easier for showing some languages not being context-free, we need a third condition. So what is this third condition? So uh, what we can do is, remember when we were talking about the regular pumping lemma, we required that the pumped uh, piece, which is the, the Y part, to be as close to the beginning as possible within the first P characters. The idea here is that if we have these variables repeating from the top to the bottom, so let's say that A is here and then A is here, then what we're going to do here is we're going to assume that we are talking about the repetitions as close to the bottom as possible. So let's sure I write that down. So let's say that these two are the repetitions, although it doesn't look like it, uh, these are the repetitions closest to the bottom. Or the leaves of the tree, same thing. So uh, why is that? Why do we want to do that? Suppose that the string that we're making is really, really big, like more, way, way, way more than, uh, than this two to the number of vars thing. Suppose it's way bigger than that. Then what we can do is if we focus on a, a piece of it uh, like this uh, right here, this repetition, if we just consider it maybe maybe at this variable or maybe slightly above it, what we can ensure is that uh, this part, uh, as long as it's at least uh, two to the number of vars plus one plus one, whatever, it doesn't matter what that number is, as long as we consider a subtree of su uh, where the, or at least a substring of the thing that we're making, as long as it's at least this magic number, then what we can guarantee is that within the sub parse tree right here, uh, there must be a repetition. So must be a repetition uh, within uh, this within uh, this sub parse tree. Make sure it's all the screen. Okay. Uh, why do we want to do that? Well. Remember that we want to establish some kind of this pumped piece is, is at most this uh, magic number. So what we can guarantee is, well, this part is the V, this part's the X, this part's the Y. Well, uh, if we consider this part right here, then what we can guarantee is that 
Um, even at the worst possible case, these two repetitions are as far, even though they're the closest to the bottom, they're really free and far apart from the bottom. Then what we can guarantee is that uh, V, X, Y, the whole thing, because this is what is generated by both of the pumps, uh, the, I'm sorry, both of the repeating variables, this part is at most this magic number. Right? Because um, it's the same idea as what we did for regular languages. So this is telling us that this part right here, even if the string is huge, the pump part that we will only need to consider is a very, very, very small piece of it, potentially, compared to how big the string could eventually be. Okay, so what we're able to uh, write down, because we just proved it, is the pumping lemma for context-free languages. So the, the way that it starts out is almost identical. So let's let L be a context-free language. Then there exists a pumping constant. If I can spell pumping, that'd be good. Pumping constant P4L. Then all that we need to do is, so this P here, is representing two to the number of vars in the grammar uh, and whatever. Although it doesn't really matter exactly what this number is. As long as it, it exists, given the grammar, then that's okay. Note that I'm not saying anything about the grammar itself. Because it's a context-free language, I know that there is a grammar for it. That's all that matters. So then what we need to do, as before, is we need to choose a string that is in the language and long enough. We need it to be in the language because we can't make a parse tree unless we have it. So uh, then we need to consider for all uh, w in L with the length of w at least that magic number, which is guaranteeing the repetition from the top to the bottom. Uh, yeah, then there exists uh, u, v, x, y, and z, such that uh, u, that the string that we have, w, is equal to put, putting all those together. Why is that? Because we read the tree leaves from left to right, and we will, uh, yeah, so remember it was broken into those five pieces uh, according to those uh, three rules such that, and then now, just like before, we have uh, those three conditions. So one, two, three. We will have that u, v to the i, x, y to the i, z is in L for all i at least zero. We will have that v, y together. It has at least one character. Or you can equivalently say that v, y is not empty. And also that the V, X, Y part, whole thing, is at most P characters. So uh, that's the uh, proof and statement of the pumping lemma. Something that's critically important to note, that in the regular case, the first two pieces, uh, when we said X, Y is at most P characters, that it was at the beginning of the string. Note that in this case, uh, we have the three pieces right here, V, X, Y, being at most P characters, but the beginning of the string is the U piece, and there's no clarification on what the string U could actually be. So it, well, the only crummy thing about this is that the V, X, Y part could technically be anywhere inside of the string. So the thing about this is that we will need to have actually more cases to be able to prove some languages to not be context-free. Um, and purely because the VXY part could technically be anywhere inside of the whole string. 
But that's the proof and the statement of the pumping lemma for context-free languages. So hopefully that was interesting. Leave any questions that you have or any other thoughts about the pumping lemma for context-free languages in the comments below. As always, please like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out. There are many other links in the video description if you want to support this channel further. And as always, I'll see you next time.